Welcome to our service here at First Baptist Church in Dawson Creek. I'm Pastor Terry, and I want to thank you for joining us. Whether you're online or whether you're through Zoom, we really appreciate your coming and being a part of this service this Sunday. Please grab your coffee and join us for a time of music, Bible reading, and the thoughts that can help you through the week and in this crazy Christmas time that we're dealing with. Let's pray to start. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity to gather together. Lord, I just thank you that you've given us a beautiful, sunshiny day. Be with us as we hear your words and we, hear your, we sing your music. And Lord, I just pray that even in the homes where they are, that the people will join in with the singing and the, and the praise to you. Thank you, Father, for this. And just bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen. I have several announcements to make. Um, I want to first of all give a shout out to all of you who attend First Baptist Church. And I've been watching and hearing how you found the gift of giving, of money, time, energy, and love. Some of the things that you have been doing, you provided 24 shoe boxes for kids overseas that have nothing. You've been helping with the fresh food packing at networks. We saw that in the paper. Helping with the Zoom and online services, all the staff that are here doing that. Praying for and calling on each other with a word of encouragement, shoveling driveways, buying and delivering groceries for others, and on it goes. Thank you for being the family of God and continuing that even though we're isolated as we are. We received a letter from Alan and Kelly Nelson who have just completed the first delivery of the Christmas hampers that we had asked you all to help provide. Their letter says it all, and I'm going to read it to you. Good morning. Kelly and I wanted to take this opportunity to pass on a heartfelt thank you to all. Yesterday, we delivered a total of 16 hampers and 33 Walmart gift cards to some wonderful and deserving people in our community. We are absolutely amazed at the way in which people from this church join forces with us on our Christmas hamper outreach. Because of all of you, it became the First Baptist Church Christmas Hamper Outreach. Your prayers and monetary donations have allowed us to reach out to people who, for various reasons, don't normally access the local food banks, and I'm sure that together, we all made their Christmases just a little bit brighter. A lot of the recipients of the hampers and gift cards were single moms with very young children, many seven years old or younger. Others were people that we have come to call the working poor of our communities. They work, often full-time hours and beyond, but because of the cost of living, struggle to make ends meet. It is our greatest hope and prayer that these hampers and gift cards will help them with a little breathing room, especially at this time of year. In total, we were able to help 31 kids and 23 adults so far. We also wanted to say a special thank you to a pair of elves, more commonly known as Ted and Bev. Bev did Christmas cards from the church for every hamper, and Ted, who we now call the human GPS of Dawson Creek, helped us find the addresses and deliver the hampers. Well done, Ted and Bev. Again, thank you to all of you. Wishing you all the warmest of Christmas blessings, Alan and Kelly. And then they have received several texts back. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but from some of the recipients of those food hampers, and basically they're all saying the same thing. They're overwhelmed that this happened. They're incredibly thankful to the church for that. We even have one young lady um, saying, I'm assuming it's a young lady, saying that uh, she's looking forward to when we get our services back in so that she can come and be a part of the church after helping her out so much. Just know that your generous donations did incredible things for people in this community. And, And as I've been listening and hearing, Other churches are doing the same. We are reaching out. We're doing what we're supposed to do. Be God's people. Pray for the families to get through Christmas without sorrow or strife. Pray that God will show himself to them so they can experience the true reason for Christmas. Pray for friends, neighbors, and those who come to your mind. Reach out and contact them with God's love. Remember, we are commanded to give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you, from 1 Thessalonians 5.18. All circumstances, we're supposed to praise God, and we need to do that, and be thankful. At this point, we're going to do the Advent lighting. Over the past three Sundays, we have lit the candles of hope, peace, and joy. 
On this fourth Sunday of Advent, as we think about the coming of Jesus Christ, we light the candle of love. Listen to what the Bible tells us about love. 1 John 3, 1 says, How great is the love the Father has lavished on us. How great is that love. This is how God showed his love. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. 1 John 4, 9. John 13, 34, and 35 says, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. All men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. In all this hustle and bustle of the season, we need to stop and hear what God is saying to each of us. You might be surprised at what your gift is this Christmas. And I'm going to add something here. We just discovered this neat little thing that God did last night. He made snowballs. Simple. But boy, if you stop and notice it, it's incredible. Can you ever figure out how they make those things? God makes them different than us. Let's pray. Dear God, by the power of, the, of your spirit, move us to make the preparations needed to welcome you, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Soften our hearts and open us anew to your life and love, that we may be transformed and be agents of transformation in the lives of others. For Jesus' sake, amen. And now I turn it over to Barb. Good morning, everybody, and welcome. I'd like to read from Luke 2, verses 8 to 14 this morning. That night, some shepherds were in the fields outside the village, guarding their flocks of sheep. And suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them. And the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terribly frightened, but the angel reassured them. Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news of great joy for everyone. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born tonight in Bethlehem in the city of David. And this is how you will recognize him. You will find a baby lying in a manger, wrapped snugly in strips of cloth. And suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven praising God. Glory to God in the highest heaven, and peace on earth to all who God favors. Amen. Amen. Let us sing this morning His Majesty in a Manger. Oh, what a mystery, oh, what a love From heaven to Bethlehem lavished on us all who are searching, come follow the star. There in the stable, the hope of our hearts. Oh, come and see Christ the King, His majesty in a manger. Oh, come adore Christ the Lord. our song bow down before him messiah has come all of our longing and all of our fear silence forever but jesus he's here oh come and see christ the king his majesty in a manger oh come Christ the Lord, His majesty in a manger, His majesty in a manger. Oh, come let us adore, oh, come let us adore Him, His 
next song this morning we would like to do beautiful one
And so once again, we are going to do our theme song <clears throat> for the month of December, and that is the hope of the nations, the hope that we have in Christ and the assurance that he gives us.
lift our voices this morning. You are the Prince of Peace, author of love. Thank you for your singing. Bless you all this morning. You caught me off guard. I thought we were doing another one. Thank you, Barbara and It is so much fun having live music in here. Um, I just, I, we can get into it a little more and we have fun with it. You can't see what we're doing behind the camera. Otherwise, you'd begin to think we're all a bunch of Looney Tunes. But anyway, it's, it's a lot of fun. Today, my message is entitled... God is love. We've all stated at one time or another that we love like God loves, that God loves through us, and that our love is God's love. Have you ever considered the thought that God is love? We're into the fourth week of Advent, the Hope, Peace, Joy, Love, Light series of readings. Please join us for our Christmas Eve service on our website at 6.30 when we will be looking at Christ, the light for the world. This week we look at God is love. The Apostle Paul, sorry, the Apostle John wrote lots about God's love, both in the Gospel of John and in the three letters he wrote from prison. First, in that Gospel of John, he quotes Jesus on the subject of God's love in action. John 13, verses 34 and 35 tell us A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Very clearly saying we need to love one another. That's how we show God's love. It's an action. It's a thing that we do to be able to help people to see the God who is love. And Jesus over and over and over again tells us that. To the point where some people say, well, Jesus is love and Jesus was all about love and everything he came was all about love. And I'm saying, well, that could be true. And it is. 
But he was so much more. He was the God who saved us. And that is his love to us that we can't turn around and do for somebody else. We can't save somebody. But we can share the gospel. We can share the message of God and his love so that people can look for it and find it and and be saved. So we have a job to do to be able to show God his love. Then in his first letter from prison, John states how he sees God and love put together. 1 John chapter 4. And we're going to look at the first, three, or first four verses 7 to 10 there. Starting with verse 7. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Sometimes I wonder, is that truly saying that, that uh, only those of us that love come from God? I see people who are incredible Uh, People who love people and do things for people, but they don't know God yet. But you see, I believe that when we are born, we have God characteristics. That when we find God and and we start learning about God, those come out of us and flow out of us. But they're there already because they're a characteristic that he's given us at birth. All men were made to have God with them. We just sometimes don't choose to go there. And we don't grow in that area. Verse 8 says, Whoever does not love does not know God. Because God is love. You have to know him to understand what love is. And we're going to look at that in a minute. Verse 9 says, This is how God showed his love among us. This is the key thing. This is the, the biggest showing of love that God could do for us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. We just finished the fourth candle of Advent, showing the leading up to the birth of Christ on Christmas morning. The birth of this child who was to become Jesus, who was to become the light of the world, who was to become the, the, the person that everyone talks about. And I don't care whether you know him or not, you talk about him. Because it's just too hard to miss where God fits in this world. And you're going to see it and hear it. And you've got to say something about it. And you might disagree about who he is and what he is. But you talk about him. In fact, I'm going to go on a limb here and say that I think we talk way more about Jesus and God than we do about Trump. And that's, for this year, that's a pretty big statement. But we do. And we have this book called the Bible that's been around for thousands of years. And it hasn't changed. Sure, we have newer versions with modern language in it, but the truth hasn't changed. What it's saying hasn't changed. Verse 10 says, this is love. Not that we loved God. That's not love. But that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Jesus was born on Christmas morning. That's what we celebrate. But he died on a cross for our sins, not for his. For the penalty that we have created for ourselves. God did that for us. That's love. John Packer in his book, To Know God, says, To know God's love is indeed heaven on earth. And the New Testament sets forth this knowledge, not as the privilege of a favored few, but as a normal part of ordinary Christian experience. Love is indeed heaven on earth. When I found God, my life changed. And all of a sudden, this hard earth that we're living on didn't seem so hard. There was a new part of my life And it was a better part of my life. And I want to encourage you, if your life is hard, if you're struggling, take a look at this Jesus that we talk about and that we celebrate his birth at Christmas. Take a look at him. Open his Bible and read it. Find out if you agree or disagree. But take a look. 1 John 4, verses 11 and 12 
John's continuing his letter here. And he says, Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. He's repeating what Jesus said. You need to love one another. Verse 12, No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. And, I, and I'm going to add to that on the Christmas Eve service, so you can come and listen to some more of that. But God is in us. And we have to go and share that love that he's given us with other people. And I quite often use that example of it fills us up and then it pours out of us. We can't contain God's love. It just spreads. It's incredible. John Ortberg, a gentleman that I've done some Bible studies on, um, had this to say. Some people would rather debate doctrine or beliefs or tradition, or interpretation, than actually do what Jesus said. It's not rocket science. And then he adds, just go do it. Practice loving a difficult person, or try forgiving someone. Give away some money. Tell someone thank you. Encourage a friend. Bless an enemy. Say I'm sorry. Worship God. You already know more than you need to know is how he ends that off. If you can do all those things, you've learned a lot. And you're able to do a lot. And after what I've been watching with the food hampers that are going out and the way people are helping other people, I'm going, wow, God is alive in this world today. And there are people who don't even know him that are doing great things. But I know it's because inside God has already filled their heart and he's trying to tell them, here, I'll show you what it's like to walk with me. I think that sometimes we wander away and we try to go our own way and we've discovered that it gets really hard and it gets really um, awkward and miserable sometimes. There's never a time that's too late to turn around and say to God, okay, I think I made a mistake and uh, I'd like to get back on the right path. God's love never ends. Never ends. And you need to know that. You need to realize that you can trust this God who is love. John, 1 John 4, verses 16 and 17, we continue. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God, and God in him. Verse 17, in this way love is made complete among us so that we will have full confidence in the day of judgment. Because in this world we are like him who is Jesus. We need to rely on the love of God because he is love. And we need to show people around us that he is love. And when we do that, there's this thing. It's called completeness. We finally fill in the voids and the holes and the, and the, and the parts of us that aren't quite right. It's all covered in love. The joy of love. I was at a conference at a church over in Grand Prairie, and I can't remember which church it was, but on their wall they had a, a, a mural kind of thing. And it says, in this church... We are real. We know people aren't perfect. We give second chances. We have fun. We believe the Bible is truth. We forgive. We extend grace. We live by faith. We have hope in Jesus. We love. Once you start to know God a little bit, you'll start to see yourself changing. You'll start to find areas that you've never even thought that were possible for you to get into and to do and things that you can help people with that you never would have dreamt of. The love of God is real. It's something you can take and hang on to. It's a promise. But that love of God and that God who is love has characteristics And things that we need to adapt into our own lives. 
In 1 Corinthians 13, which is an incredible scripture, the whole chapter, um, talking about God's love and, and about how that works and how we are supposed to do it. But verses 4 to 7, I want to read them off to you because I want to explain how they're important. Verse 4 starts, Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. Goes on, it is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. And verse 7 says, It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. All these are why I know God is love. Because I see all of these in my relationship with God, and I can trust him to help develop those things in me. It's important that we look at that list. So don't lose it. Verses 4 to 7, 1 Corinthians 13. We need to develop that. And I guarantee you, when you read through that list again, you'll go, well, I, I can't do that. And, and, and well, no, I'm, I'm lousy at that. And, whoa, I need help with that. True. Because you see, that list is the characteristics of God who is perfect. And we're not. We're working on it. And Paul says, I'm a work in progress. We are working towards that. So you will need to develop those things. You will need to look at that and say, we're, we're, I need to work on that today. And you know, if you ask God to help you work on those things, I will guarantee you he will. There's the old saying that don't pray for patience because he'll give you troubles. Because how do you learn patience? You got to have some struggles. And so... If you pray that he will help you with these, expect that he will help you with those. But it might not be the way you're thinking. He doesn't always give us the easy way. Oh, here it is. Just have it. Sometimes we have to learn it and grow it and develop it. God is love, and that love is so powerful, constant, and flowing to me, through me, and out to you. It's a never-ending flow job. It just keeps going. It's like, it's like the greatest volcano eruption ever. And the lava flows, but it never, ever, ever hits the sea and hardens. It just keeps flowing. God's love is incredible. Ephesians 3, verses 17 to 19 help us understand how incredible that is. It starts with, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That's how we get him. We have to have the faith and believe that he's there. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, God's love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. They're covering all the directions there. There is no end to God's love. I don't care if you go down, up, sideways, forward, backwards, there is no end to God's love. And we need to know that. We need to grab a hold of it because we have the power together with everybody who believes in this to do great things for God in this world. And then verse 19 says, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Love that surpasses knowledge. Do you understand what that means? That means there's no way we can understand the total concept of God's love. Our knowledge isn't vast enough because it's bigger. So when you get a little down or you get discouraged or you go, God's not helping me or I'm, I don't think God's doing his thing, understand it's not because he doesn't love you. There's got to be something else going on. We need to look to God. We need to search out God. We need to follow what he wants us to do. We need to follow his directions. And we need to be his ambassadors, be his vessels to the world. People do not get across an ocean without getting into a vessel, whether it's a boat or a plane. Either one, 
Well, I guess you can go under a submarine, but you have to have a vessel to get across that ocean. We are the vessels from God to other people who don't know him. And we need to be ready to go. We need to be ready to grab the load and take it over and share it with people and do that. The Apostle Paul's heart was for God and the people that he had gotten to know. He always stressed the need to allow God's love to come in and go out of each of us. There is nothing we cannot go through if we follow these guidelines and we trust God who is love. Trust God who is love. When I started this message, I said, we know how to show love. We know how to accept love. We know how to tell people about love. But did we realize that God is love? That's the source of everything that we do. That is the, the root, the base, the cornerstone of everything that we believe and everything that we do. And we need to share that with people. So here's a question for you. When's the last time you told someone God is love, that God loves them, and that they can learn about that love if they seek it out? If you haven't for a while, I encourage you to do that. In fact, I'd ask you to pray and ask God to give you that opportunity. He'll give you the words. He'll give you the, the person to talk to. But take the opportunity because you see, when you let that love flow out of you, it increases your love for God. It increases your, your feeling of, of healthy and well-being. It's important that we share what's inside of us. And I want to encourage you, this week, go out and tell people, God is love. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time of remembering the arrival of your son. And Lord, I just praise you that as you sacrificed so much to come down here and walk amongst us, to help us to see that you understand our plight, our life, our struggles, and that you did it for us, not for you. Lord, we praise you for that. We praise you for Jesus as a, as a baby, a young man, and Lord, as a savior. We thank you that he was willing to do all that for us. And as we remember that, in a few days we're going to celebrate Christmas morning, Lord, I pray that we will really understand what that morning was all about. How you gave us a gift that nobody else can give us. That how you came down and you showed your love to us in a way that nobody else had done. And now, Father, help us to grab a hold of that love and then to share it with others. In your son's precious name, amen. Now I'll ask Barb to do another song. For our closing uh, song this morning, we'd like to do a silent night, holy night. What a gift God gave us in his son. What a, what a gift of love on that wonderful night. You must think about it so many thousands of years ago. His greatest gift of love was in the form of a tiny babe. Silent night, holy night.
I just was thinking as we were singing that song, the Apostle John, when he wrote those letters from prison on the island of Patmos, he was isolated, locked down, uh, couldn't get around and see people, couldn't do anything else. So what did he do? He wrote letters. Letters of love to the people he cared about. I want to encourage you, be like that. While we're locked down and we can't get together, and I know there's a lot of families that are really not happy about being able to get together for Christmas. Doesn't stop you from Zooming each other, writing letters. We might have to go back to old-fashioned parcel giving. Yeah. But take the time to do that. And you know, the Bible is full of a lot of neat things that come out of isolation, separation. And so I want to encourage you. I wanted to read this next week, but I'm going to do it today. I want to close with Psalm 23. And this is a psalm from David, and it's an encouraging psalm, but yet it's a real reality of being alone with God. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you, Lord Jesus, are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I hope that you can find rest and peace beside the quiet waters of God's love. Go out this week and reach out to somebody in love and try to have the best Christmas you can. God bless. Mm -hmm.